talk about the impact of the fall from Genesis 3 and talk about the image of God in Genesis 1 and, and try to balance and understand and talk about um, um, doctrines like total depravity, but understanding our innate value that God's placed in us because we're, we're image bearers and we were made um, by him and we carry that with us in each individual life. And there's, there's kind of like nothing that a group of, of Bible students love more than sort of like a robust debate around the finer points of like biblical theology. Like it just sort of, we're in our element, you know, and kind of doing all these things, kicking this around. And, and, but what's interesting is in my nearly almost 20 years now of pastoral ministry, I've probably had less than a handful of conversations with adults or students on, on that very same topic. Um, and so all this time spent in college, in classrooms and on dorm floors, discussing the finer points of the condition of mankind, with people in ministry, it really hasn't come up um, that often. And that's not to say that, that it's not important or, or even vital, really, um, it's, a, it's a vital theological conversation. It's important for us to understand. It, it informs the way we um, talk about the gospel. It informs the way we express it to the community that surrounds us. Um, I believe it's absolutely critical, kind of a theological baseline that, that we need to have. And yet, kind of where the rubber meets the road... Um, this doesn't seem to be the, the question, in my experience, that people are asking of me. Um, far more often on the, on the pastoral or the relational side of ministry, what I experience is, is people who are living and in, in seeing and taking in the reality of a broken world and dealing personally with the ramifications of it. So they're not wondering how this all balances out. What they're looking at and seeing and saying is clearly something isn't right. And, and how do we respond to it? What I encounter more than anything else is, is people asking the question, why? Um, whether it's their own personal experiences that they're processing or just what they see unfolding around them. Personally, for me, and I don't know if you're like this at all or not, but I have to almost sort of monitor or, or be careful of how much time I spend watching the news. Because it's just one thing after another of, of pain and suffering and agony and humanity being so cruel to each other. And it's all around us and it becomes overwhelming. Whether we look and we see stories about teenagers being abducted or or violence in the streets of our inner cities, or corruption in our government, or global terrorism, or, or economic issues and the impact of, of poverty worldwide. It could go on and on and on. And that's just what gets crammed into 30 minutes of, of the evening news together. And that's just sort of what comes at us from, from the outside. I mean, for most of us, the reality is our everyday relationships we experience, whether it's ourselves or people that we love, asking the question, why? Working with students all the time when, when a marriage um, is crumbling around them and they see their parents divorcing, they're asking the question, why? When our own sense of economic security begins to let us down, we ask the question, why? Um, when we watch someone that we love, that we care about, suffer, we ask that question. When the diagnosis comes back from the doctor and there's fear, we come back to that question. All of this and, and a thousand other sort of situations and circumstances and experiences oftentimes leave us with this fundamental foundational question that seems to be common to humankind. Why, why is this going on? Why is it this way? Um, sometimes it, that question is somewhat generic or, or universal as we look at the world around us. I think oftentimes it's deeply personal, born out of a sense of our own suffering or, or an awareness of injustice or just even our own kind of 
lack of understanding, and we're left asking the question, why? If you've been with us over the last uh, few weeks, we've been in a series entitled The Healer, looking at the miracles of, of Jesus as a part of our overarching theme this year, looking at the story of Jesus. And so, so far we've looked at the story of the leper and the paralytic from Luke chapter 5. Two separate experiences or instances of Jesus meeting someone and, and healing them, uh, meeting them in the place of their greatest need. Last week, Pastor Jeff taught on the restoration of sight in Bartimaeus from uh, Mark chapter 10. Um, in, in each one of these stories, in each one of these experiences, what we gain or what's revealed to us is another truth or more um, expands our understanding of, of who Jesus is. Uh, today we're, gonna, we're going to examine, I think, one of the perhaps maybe the most commonly known or most famous instances of Jesus performing a miracle in the New Testament. Um, and one that clearly contains, interesting enough, the same question of why. The same question of why uh, someone is experiencing pain, why suffering is a reality, why there is loss. It seems to be so part and parcel of, of our human condition. But in response to that, what we gain from this question of why is once again a fuller understanding of who Jesus is and what he is here to do. Um, so together, let's look at the miracle of the raising of Lazarus in, Lazarus in, uh, in John chapter 11. If you would turn there with me, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to kind of work our way through the majority of this chapter um, in the next several minutes together. This is John 11, verse 1. I'm going I'm to read verse 1 through verse 11 here to start with. It says, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. And when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days in the place where he was. After that, which is just, I mean, pausing there for a moment, that seems counterintuitive, right? He hears Lazarus is ill and he stays longer. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? And anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and awake him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Let's pause there for a moment. I wanna, I'm going to give a bit of a disclaimer here because there's a lot of text that we're going to work our way through this evening. And so I am going to skip over some things that would be worth developing to kind of get in the whole general picture. Um, but there's some stuff we're just not going to be able to hit on. But what I want to look at is this fuller understanding of who Jesus is. And what stands out to me in the text is we begin to experience this encounter with Mary and Martha um, is that it, it begins by a greater understanding of the purpose of Jesus. Um, the purpose of Jesus. At the outset of this passage, it occurs to me that this encounter is somewhat different than most of the um, previous miracles that we've studied up to this point. Really different than, than most of the miracles that I can think of throughout the New Testament. Because the majority of the time when someone is coming to Jesus, they are coming to Him as strangers. Meaning that they don't have any previous relationship with Jesus. But in this case, it's clear in the text that Lazarus and his sisters and uh, Mary and Martha are 
are friends of Jesus. They, they know him. Matter of fact, in, in Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus is teaching in their home. There's a whole story there that you'll remember where Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him teach, and, and Martha is busy preparing the dinner and being the gracious host, and Jesus sort of has to intercede in the bit of a, a, a sibling conflict. Uh, John tells us here that it's, it's Mary who, before Jesus would travel to Jerusalem to face his trial and crucifixion, would, would anoint his feet and dry his feet with, with her hair. Um, it's clear from the text that, that Martha and Mary and Lazarus are all they're, they're personal friends of Jesus. And why is this important? Why, why do we need to pay attention to this? Because it reveals something in this text about the expectation that they came to with Jesus. Because they're so close with Jesus, because they have been around him and his disciples, they would have either personally experienced or at the very least heard a great deal about the various miracles that Jesus had performed. They would know about his ability to, to heal other people. People were constantly coming to Jesus, bringing with them their sick and their blind and their paralyzed and, and the demon possessed. And Jesus is meeting them in that place and he'll touch them and heal them. They're seeing lives restored, incredible things. And these are all strangers. These are, these are people who didn't necessarily have a previous relationship with Jesus. But Mary and Martha, and this is Lazarus. They, they know Jesus. You saw in the text, right? There was a couple different comments about love. They even refer as Lazarus to Jesus as him whom you love. He said he's sick. They have certain expectations that in this moment of their greatest need, in this moment when they are most desperate, certainly Jesus now in that moment will come to their rescue. That he will intercede on their behalf. Surely his willingness to heal so many other people, to, to meet them, to respond to what they ask of him, that Jesus will do this for them. That he'll be there to heal Lazarus. But this isn't the case. What unfolds here in this text is a clash between the expectations of Mary and Martha and the ultimate purpose of Jesus. I want to I point out two quick statements that we see here regarding purpose in this text. The first came in verse 4. It says, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. If this response is actually very similar to what we see in John chapter 9, just two chapters earlier, when his disciples are asking questions of Jesus about a man that was born blind. This is John 9, verses 1 through 5. And it says, as he passed by, you'll see actually a lot of correlation here. He saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not this man, it, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. But as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Here in both cases, now there's this overarching theme of purpose, this overarching purpose that is unfolding. And ultimately, according to the text, it says it is for God's glory. The final result of what Jesus wants to accomplish here is not a, a issue of victory over death, but rather it is for the glory of the Father and for the glory of the Son. So now here you see that there's this, this expectation, this clash of expectation and, and the ultimate purpose that Jesus is operating under. I, I can only speak for myself here, but perhaps you've experienced this or you can relate to this as well. But some of my some of my most desperate questions please before God when I am asking him why has been in 
in conflict of my expectations and his ultimate purpose. My definition of what is good or right or my understanding of what is transpiring around me is limited by the picture that I can see, by what I can see unfolding, by the conclusion that I desire to see worked out. But Jesus here is motivated by something greater. He's operating under a greater purpose. And it would be that same purpose that would ultimately then lead Jesus to the cross. I can remember on a, on a personal level experience of this, even being frustrated by it. Um, some of you may know five years ago, my dad passed away from pancreatic cancer. And I remember just praying uh, fervently, diligently asking God to heal my dad and, 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 and believing, believing that he could and believing that he would. And sometimes I would hear my dad pray. Obviously, he was the one suffering with this, dealing with it. And so his, his prayers, but I remember sometimes almost feeling like I wanted to correct him in his prayers because dad would oftentimes pray, God, use this for something. Bring, bring people to know Jesus. Glorify your name. Like, however you want to work. He's like, I'm all in. And I'm like, what he means, God, is like, remove the cancer. Like, that's what he meant to say, you know, like. My, my, I, sometimes I wanted to be like, dad, you're not saying it right. You're not asking the right things. And I remember when, when dad passed away and, and dealing with all this kind of upheaval in your soul that so many of you know and have experienced it and, and thinking about it. And I remember even struggling with what's, what's the purpose? What's the nature of prayer? And I remember, you know, like God answered his prayer. God answered his prayer, exactly. I mean, we saw literally people come to know Jesus at, at his funeral service. I was like, that's, that's exactly the words that he prayed. Perhaps he understood, perhaps he saw a greater purpose than I was able to see and to even ask for. I think that's where Jesus is showing us something. He's operating under a greater, over a greater purpose. In addition then to this stated purpose of God's ultimate glory, Jesus now offers another perspective on, on purpose here in the text. Let's pick it back up. I'm going to go back into verse 11 and read through verse 16. It says, After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he might be taking a rest in sleep. Which is just, it's great to see sometimes the disciples struggle so much with what Jesus is saying. It's, I, I find that slightly relatable. Um, and then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there. So that you may believe, again, another statement of purpose. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Jesus here, again, offers another statement of purpose. In addition to revealing the glory of God, he's added this purpose of promoting the faith of his closest followers. Jesus says, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Jesus now is preparing his disciples. He's showing them something. He's building a faith in them. This encounter with Lazarus is about bringing glory to God and growing the faith of those who are following him. Jesus knows full well that his disciples are about to experience an enormous clash of their expectations with the ultimate purpose of God. They're about to experience the ultimate, pushed beyond their limits, beyond what they can bear. Jesus now is using this very specific purpose to glorify God, to grow the faith of those who will carry on the name of Jesus, who will preach the gospel. He continues on. He moves on in this work, and I think he does the same thing in our lives. I think he continues to work towards these purpose in, in his church and in us, his followers, his, his disciples, those that continue to carry on his purpose, his plan. Additionally, then, as the text goes on, we begin to see something about the identity of Jesus. 
the identity of Jesus. Back in verse 17 now. It says, Now when Jesus came, He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, again, here's here's the why, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. After Jesus now delays his return to Bethany until after the time that Lazarus has passed away, he arrives on the scene. Martha comes running out to meet Jesus, and as she does, she brings with her her question, her why, Lord, if you you had been here, have you, ever, have you ever done that with God? Have you ever brought that question? I know, I, I know that I have. And this interaction between Jesus and, and Martha here is absolutely critical. And I love the way that Jesus responds to her. There's no, there's no harshness. He's not upset with Martha. He seems to understand that she needs to come to him with this ultimate question that he needs to ask. Why, why weren't you here? Why did Lazarus have to die? As she asks her question, she even does so with an expression of faith. In verse 22, she says, But even now, I know whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. And Jesus responds to her and says, Your brother will rise again. Now Martha, like many Jews at the time, had a general sense that there would be a resurrection at the end of time. Um, for the purpose of, of God judging those who had passed on. Um, and so Martha assumes that this is what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus then responds to her question of why with a greater understanding of who he is, with this specific statement of identity. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. This this text here is the spiritual center of this story. It's not about the resurrection of Lazarus at the end. This statement of identity is the spiritual center of the story, and not just this story, but really the entire story of Jesus that we've been looking at, and in many ways, the entire story of the Bible. This is the watershed moment, the spiritual center of all human history. Why? Because for Jesus to say, to identify as the resurrection, he first has to allow himself to experience death. Now, in in really no uncertain terms, Jesus is revealing the fullness of who he is and what he has come to do. The love that we see in Jesus expressed for Martha and Mary and Lazarus, it's not in the fact that he will raise Lazarus from the dead, but rather in the fact that he will die for them. Jesus is is the means by which sin and death will ultimately be conquered, Not, not temporarily, but for all eternity. Timothy Keller, who is an author and a a pastor in in New York, uh, wrote a book entitled Encounters with Jesus. And he comments on this experience of Mary and Martha here in John chapter 11. And he says, Jesus is God writing himself into the story of the world. Jesus is God writing himself in to the story of the world. In this single statement of identity, everything changes. 
It changes our perspective as human beings. Our perspective is oftentimes so limited to the here and now, the world that we can see around us, to this life and all that it contains. But in Christ, in Christ who is the resurrection and the life, there is so much more. See, what I saw, what we oftentimes see as the healing of the body being the ultimate purpose, Jesus sees the healing of the soul as being far more important. When we think from a limited perspective focused on the here and now, He sees eternity and all that is in it. And it's by Him and through Him that we have hope. The promise of eternal life, of who He is. Our perspective is oftentimes so limited, but this statement of identity, identity here in John chapter 11 begins to change everything. As we continue through the text then, we see the identity of Jesus, and now we come to the point where we discover the grief of Jesus. This is verse 28. It says, When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying. There is a clear expression of grief. And and this, this expression of grief by Jesus in this text has always stuck out to me as as being somewhat unique. If I'm being completely honest, I first came across this text when my Sunday school teacher used to offer us a piece of candy for memorizing verses. And my brothers and I saw it like, you know, all throughout Scripture, finding the shortest verses to, to memorize for the acquisition of candy. And although I was motivated by sugar, primarily, what I remember as a boy reading that text, memorizing it, was that Jesus, Jesus cried. Um, that finding it somewhat relatable and, and thinking that, I think it gave me like a introduction as a kid into the fact that Jesus was both human and, and fully God. Um, and I could, I could relate to him because I, I cried too. Um, I think that this, this verse, um, now when we see Jesus in his grief and we see him in his pain and, and, and Mary comes to him, now Mary comes with her question of why, and he's standing in front of the tomb Jesus is moved to tears. I, I want to briefly and quickly just make a few comments about the nature of his grief because I think this is important and I don't want to overlook this. This expression of grief is, is at one level, it is a personal grief. I think Jesus is seeing his friend in the tomb and it's a validation, this experience, this expression of grief is a validation of what we experience in our pain and suffering and loss. The observing of grief in Jesus um, spurred others to say, look how he loves him. Look how much he loves him. We're taught that that grief is the outworking of love. Um, And great grief comes from great love. We grieve as humans because we were created in the image of God. A God who loves, and as such, he is a God who grieves. Genesis chapter 6, right? God grieves when he sees the condition of the world, the sin and the evil running rampant through it. But I think beyond that, Jesus is also grieving over sin and brokenness and death. This is not what he intended. This is not what he created. 
Verse 33, it's translated, it says, He was deeply moved in His spirit and greatly troubled. Jesus here uses a word that is only found in this chapter of the book of John, and it's only used twice here. It's, it's very difficult to translate. It kind of comes out as groaned in spirit or actually physically kind of snorted like an angry horse. There's, there's rage in that verse. Uh, Timothy Keller, who I mentioned earlier, says this. He, he says the correct translation of that word, or the most accurate, and in his opinion, is bellowed with anger. To bellow with anger. Keller writes, Jesus is absolutely furious. He is bellowing with rage. He is roaring. Jesus is raging against death. He did not make a world filled with sickness, suffering, and death. His rage is directed at the one who has introduced sin and evil and death into the world, his great enemy, Satan himself. The one he calls the serpent in the garden, the, the liar, the deceiver, the destroyer, the one that he will ultimately defeat at the end of all things. Lastly, then, I think Jesus also grieves because he knows what it's going to cost him to pay the price. Keller goes on to say, that's why when Jesus approached the tomb, instead of smiling at the prospect of putting on a good show, he is shaking with anger and had tears on his cheeks. He knew what it would cost him to save us from death. Jesus knew that he would soon be leaving Lazarus, that he would be heading to Jerusalem, and he is grieving what is in front of him. Lastly, then, as we wrap up this text, we see the authority of Jesus. The authority of Jesus. In each of these instances, in each of these miracles we've studied, we've, we've understood that it's not about the miracle itself, but rather what the miracle points to, or, or who the miracle points to. We saw in the leper that it's not about the miracle, it's about the fact that Jesus' holiness took away his uncleanliness, and for that matter, it takes ours away as well. When we saw the healing of the paralytic, it's about the fact that Jesus is God, that he has the one who can forgive sins. And now as we enter into this text, we see the authority of Jesus to conquer death. In verse 38 now, it says, When Jesus deeply moved again, this is the second use of that verb, came to the tomb, it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now here in the text, we see the why behind this miracle. Why Jesus waited this greater purpose. Why Jesus ultimately came into the world. Why he would ultimately go to the cross and conquer death. That they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he spoke to Lazarus. He cried out in a loud voice and he said, Lazarus, come out. To picture this, we have to let go of the image of Jesus that we had in Sunday school where Jesus is sitting peacefully, sort of petting a, a lamb. This Jesus now is roaring with anger. He is bellowing with rage. This is Jesus crying out against all the sin and death in the world. This is Jesus bellowing against a child being taken from their home against senseless violence unfolding in our streets, against the sort of poverty that would force a mother to choose which child she is going to feed, against the sort of terrorism and wars that are raging in our world. This is Jesus bellowing against cancer and car wrecks and alcoholism and porn addiction and domestic violence. This is Jesus bellowing out against my own sin because he would ultimately pay the price. He would carry that for me. This is Jesus 
who knows that in order to be the resurrection, he would first have to suffer the cross. With all the authority of God, Jesus declares in a loud voice, in a loud voice that death would not have victory. And he commands Lazarus and he says, Lazarus, come out. Once again, Jesus gives us a sense, a fuller sense of who he is. Mary and Martha came to Jesus with the question, why? And the answer they received came in a greater understanding of his purpose, his identity, the grief that he carried, and the authority that was his. And once again, he does so, so that they may believe that you sent me. Would you pray with me? Father, we, God, we need you. Lord, we recognize that we need you to intersect, to intercede. That we need to understand the fullness of who you are. To meet us in the place of our greatest need and with authority declare that you have victory. That you are the one who has overcome death. You've overcome sin. And in you there is wholeness once again. Lord, thank you for suffering all things so that we might have life in you. It's your name we pray. Amen.